thank you. Grab your cup of coffee or tea and grab a seat, and I'd like to get us started. Okay, thank you all for being here today. It is definitely a pleasure to have everyone in, in person in our first in-person Innovate New Mexico since 2020. And by the way, our event in 2020 was on March 3rd, and that was about 10 days before the shutdown. And John Clark told me this morning that he sincerely hopes that our event was not causing the shutdown. No, just kidding. But we were socializing for sure. Uh, three years ago, and then the last two years on Zoom. So it's really nice to see everyone here in person. So we have a number of sponsors for our event today. Uh, the Richard Feynman Center for Innovation, Sandia, New Mexico Economic Development Department, New Mexico State's Arrowhead Center, New Mexico Manufacturing Extension Partnership, Air Force Research Lab, New Mexico Tech, and the Federal Lab Consortium, as well as UNM Rainforest Innovations. So I'm Lisa Kutala, president of Rainforest Innovations, and the partners among the state's research institutions uh, have organized this event today, and we uh, hope you enjoy all the presentations from our uh, investigators, from our startup companies, and also the potential collaborators for all of you. As a reminder, we do have the sunroom where uh, exhibitors have tables and, and please during the networking breaks um, uh, visit their, their tables. And so we'd like to get started with our introductory speaker, John Clark. John is our Deputy Cabinet Secretary for Economic Development in New Mexico. John's been with the Legislative Finance Committee since 2012 and has been instrumental in analyzing state revenue trends, tax changes, and investments. He's also served as a business development manager and helped bring new jobs to the State of New Mexico Partnership. While at LFC, he also served for four years as staff co-chair of the Labor and Economic Development Committee of the National Conference of State Legislatures. And he worked with legislators and legislative staff across the country on economic development issues and analysis of incentive programs. Before his work at LFC, he was at the New Mexico Partnership for five and a half years, recruiting businesses to our state. Before that, he worked with local entrepreneurs and with Sandia National Laboratories and Los Alamos National Laboratory to spin off technologies developed by scientists. Uh, John is a native of Albuquerque and has an MBA from the University of New Mexico Anderson School of Management. So welcome, John. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you all of you for being here. I'm really hoping that this first time back after 2020 doesn't spark another three-year uh, shutdown and it cause everyone to go back home. Uh, first off, I just want to mention that uh, if you'd like to come talk to the Economic Development Department, uh, I'm going to be here throughout the day, but we also have a booth in the sunroom in the back over there. I think our booth has the, the best, best view of the mountains, mountain. so, so come, come get the view, talk to our, talk to our team. team. Uh, they're, they're very friendly, very knowledgeable. Uh, I really look forward to the uh, presentations here today. I think we have a, a fantastic slate of speakers and topics. Uh, in particular, I'm really looking forward to our keynote speaker coming up. So I'm going to try to keep my remarks short. Uh, for economic development in New Mexico, events like this showcase are critical to connect entrepreneurs with the strategic partners who can nurture innovation and launch them into the marketplace. This is how we build the innovation ecosystem in New Mexico, and this is how we create higher paying jobs. And that's the focus of our efforts at the Economic Development Department, to improve the lives of New Mexico families by supporting businesses and helping them thrive. 
Last year, I talked a little bit about the Economic Development Department's 20-year strategic plan called Empower and Collaborate, New Mexico's Economic Path Forward. Our mission was amplified by the data, and we determined coming out of the planning that we need to focus on the job-rich industries of tomorrow, the ones represented here today at the showcase. Aerospace, biosciences, advanced manufacturing, sustainable energy, cybersecurity, and related engineering technologies. These industries are exciting for young professionals who want to build their careers and stay in New Mexico. We often hear about the flight of uh, people getting their degrees here and then leaving. These are the jobs that will keep them here and bring additional highly educated young workers into New Mexico. The plan also speaks to not just building these industries, but to finding ways for them to flourish and remain in New Mexico. We have the potential to be a leader in each of these industries. But this requires commitment from state and local governments, as well as from the many stakeholders within the economic development ecosystem, and so I'm thrilled to see so many of our partners here today. To enable this homegrown innovation, the strategic plan recommends that the Economic Development Department build more capacity for our entrepreneurs, remove the barriers to financial resources, sustain an entrepreneur-friendly business environment, and connect entrepreneurs to critical industry knowledge and resources. So the big question, how are we doing? Well, in the past two years, the state has added 70,000 jobs, most of those high paying. For the 10 years leading up to COVID, New Mexico lost ground compared to the rest of the country on personal incomes. We know that people in New Mexico have always made less than people in the rest of the country, but what happened coming out of the Great Recession of 2008-2009 was we started to see a divergence where we were losing ground. We weren't even keeping up with the growth in the rest of the country. That started changing in 2019, and it's been getting better and better over the last four years. So that's wonderful to see. And during this time, New Mexico's job growth has exceeded the national average. New Mexico's unemployment is now at a 14-year low and has fallen the fastest in the nation in the last two months. For EDD-specific initiatives, in the past year, we have utilized LIDA to support 60 businesses, supporting more than 8,500 new jobs at an average wage of over $64,000. That's an increase of 20% from 2019. The LIDA assistance will result in $7 billion in new capital investment across New Mexico, $580 million in new payroll, and a 10-year economic impact of $34 billion. Within the Job Training Incentive Program, or JTIP, the average wage for hires hit an all-time new high uh, of over $27 an hour. That's up over 52% from four years ago. Since 2019, JTIP has awarded grants to some 10,000 trainees at 176 companies in 34 communities across the state. Spaceport America is home to six tenants, and aerospace is one of the industry clusters that is bringing these higher paying jobs to the state, and it is engaging young people in exciting STEM careers. The EDD's Office of Science and Technology is helping to drive the state's future in clean energy and low carbon technologies. It recently awarded startup grants to 10 businesses to support research and to jumpstart commercialization of products that will create more New Mexico jobs. EDD also recently received funding from the legislature to expand our network of regional reps, and today we have filled almost all of these positions. They are EDD's boots on the ground, and thanks to this funding, we now have full-time regional reps in Gallup, Bernalillo, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, Mora, Las Cruces, Portales, and Roswell. These technical experts are working directly with businesses and communities to expand and sustain economic capacity. And I mentioned the Office of Science and Technology. I uh, just want to recognize Alex Greenberg, who I see out in the audience, who just recently departed as our director of the Office of Science and Technology, did a fantastic job, and it's going to be hard to fill those shoes. As part of the strategic plan implementation, the governor signed an executive order to streamline regulations and help businesses with more online licensing approvals. Many of those changes have already been made and more are working their way through the legislature right now. EDD also now has a website to better match businesses with private lenders and other grant opportunities. The Fund It, or Business Finance Finder, is now operational and on the EDD website. And if you're a business owner or a financial organization, you can sign up and see how that works at edd.nomexico.gov BFF, not Best Friends Forever Business Finance Finder. 
Finally, the strategic plan recognized that New Mexico's startups face significant barriers in raising capital for growth and expansion. To assist here, EDD has received $74 million through SSBCI from the U.S. Treasury. We're going to receive these funds and be using them over the next 10 years uh, to support small business collateral assistance and emerging venture capital funding, some of this in tribal and underserved communities. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Norman Wynarski, someone who knows a great deal about innovation, growing startups, and the STEM culture. Norman is currently a general partner at America's Frontier Fund, where he is responsible for leading investments in innovative technologies. Previously, he was part of the team that launched Siri, the first application to put AI in the hands of consumers. He was a National Science Foundation fellow and holds a PhD in mathematics from the University of Chicago, which somehow still doesn't seem to have a college team. Uh, nor sorry, college basketball team. Norman holds patents in the areas of AI, computer vision, and optics. He is a teacher, writer, advisor, and mentor to startup ventures and entrepreneurs, and there is no better person to keynote this event. So please welcome Dr. Norman Wynarski. Thank you, John. Such a pleasure to see all of you today. I feel at home among, truthfully among the scientists are the, is my most pleasurable times often. Um, I'm not gonna have charts because I wanna talk with you. And if you have questions, sort of uh, compelling questions during my talk, feel free to bring it up. Uh, I'm also going to try and leave time at the end of the, uh, of the talk for questions about uh, anything, any of the subjects I'm talking today. So what is this America's Frontier Fund that I'm here to talk about? And, and why was it created and what can it do? Well, the whole point of this Frontier Fund was or is to recognize that we are in one of the greatest transitions of technology in the history of this country. We've had for the last 50 years technologies that were incredible that people are even mining today, right? Technologies from the internet, technologies from user, uh, user interfaces, technologies from the web, but we believe that there's a new time now, and you folks are the ones that are contributing to it. And that's in the areas of microprocessors, energy, in the areas of solar power, of fusion, and we can go on and on, clean energy. And these will determine the next great multi-trillion dollar economy. And the world recognizes this. This is not just our opinion. Major countries in the world, including China and others, are putting enormous resources and have that as their written plan to dominate technology in the next decades. And technology leads to leadership in the world and to freedom and to innovation and great, great jobs, great markets, great opportunities. So the purpose of the America's Frontier Fund is twofold. First, it's a fund. Its fund is going to have investors, but it's a little different as a fund. First of all, it's a nonprofit. And secondly, some of the investors, we hope, and we're in the midst of raising these investments now, will be the governments. And so in order to make sure that we are not rewarded in a way that's unreasonable, we made this a nonprofit. But limited partners, the people who invest in this fund, will be rewarded just as if they participated in any fund. The second thing we're going to do, there's three things that, that are fundamental 
is that we're going to focus on technology, deep technology, what we call frontier technologies. And we're going to try and help those technology developments bring to life into companies in this country, and particularly in New Mexico, actually. And we are, by doing this, recognizing that it's, this is one of the hardest problems there is. In fact, I've talked today to, where's Hal? First thing he said to me when he heard who I was was, this is going to be hard. <laughs> and it is. It's hard to create companies from deep technology because you have two elements of the company. One element is advancing the technology, and the other element is to create a great business. And together, they have to work. It's not sufficient to advance the technology. And so our approach is to solve those two problems. Now, what makes us believe that we can when it's so hard to do? I mean, people in the biotech world, they call that the valley of death, going from research into product and, and businesses. And it's called the valley of death because when you have research, you're funded by research often through National Institute of Health, whatever, uh, DARPA, federal government funds. They don't fund, though, company startups. Venture capitalists and investors fund company startups. But when they're funding them, they're looking at things that are within 18 months or 24 months of product. And between the research funding from great research institutions and from the venture capital world is the value of death, the gap. My own background at Stanford Research Institute was to create companies, and that's a long story that we have to have a drink over about how I ended up doing that, having been a mathematician. But my own story is that that's what I had to do at Stanford Research Institute. We decided that we were going to create great companies and, and uh, royalty as well from our technology. So I spent 20 years doing that, and I believe it's a uniquely different type of development to create great companies. You have here great resources to do that as well. What we want to do is add to your resources, if we can, by providing a national initiative to do that. OK. So first, there's a fund. Our goal is about 500 million or more. And New Mexico was the first investor into that fund, and we are deeply grateful. But it's also the country that has the greatest per capita PhDs in the country. You are the source of the gold. I have a uh, ranch in the, in the foothills of the Sierras, the gold country. You're the gold. You have the gold that we want to mine to help bring into new companies and new products. But to cross this valley of death, we can't just be a fund. So the second thing we're doing is called a venture studio. How many of you know what a venture studio is? OK, let me say it anyhow. It's different than an accelerator, and it's different than an incubator. Those two look for teams and help them, fundamentally. A venture studio makes companies. Its purpose is to help and co-found companies so that we can provide the resources to help co-found those companies, recruit entrepreneurs instead of wait for the team to show up and say, we have something to do. Why is that so valuable? It's valuable because in this hard tech problem of creating companies from deep technology, we have to have people that can both understand technology and understand business and bring them together. And we have those talents. Now, what makes it possible now? And it couldn't, I, I actually don't think this could have been done five years ago. 
Anybody have a suggestion? Why now? Well, I'll give you a hint, COVID. It turns out that prior to about five years ago, venture funds, venture studios, they all were actually quite local. If you were talking about a Silicon Valley venture fund, they were gonna be looking for Silicon Valley companies in Silicon Valley. And similarly in Boston and elsewhere. They felt that they had to have the resources to help the, and recruit entrepreneurs, to help with the customers, to help with the finance, to help with the legal. All of those things are enormously valuable. And so it, it, it became local. Well, during COVID, the first thing that venture capitalists did, I was a venture capitalist, I am a venture capitalist. The first thing that venture capitalists did was shut down almost everything. This is a crucible moment. Shut down, fire people, contain your resources and stop. That's what, what we're saying. And then slowly, in the first six months even, they began to invest without going to see and be with the entrepreneur. They would do it by Zoom. Without going to the company to see how it worked. They'd ask a friend to take a look or give their experiences. And then all of a sudden, the whole venture capital world seemed to break open where everyone was doing that. And so now we have the ability via Zoom and all their resources to provide remote services, remote legal, remote financial. Um, when I was running the SRI Ventures Group, I had five to 10 world-leading venture capitalists who would look at our ventures. And I was in Silicon Valley, right? Stanford Research. And now, if I ask them today, would you come in, oh, I also teach at Stanford, so I, I would say, would you come and give a talk, or would you do this, or whatever? Sure, by Zoom. It's actually easier than it's ever been to get their support. And in fact, with these venture capitalists, I'm sure we can do that with us. We can have these people look at the ventures we're creating, give us advice and support, whether it's financial, legal, whatever. So that's what changed also. And with all these resources, we can help with national resources to help build these great ventures. And that's, that's my goal, to do this with all of you. Now, now I wanna also talk about a personal story. How much time do I have, Lisa? 10, 15, uh, I'll do five minutes on a personal story. Um, maybe 10. <laughs> um, I wanna tell you how we built Siri. I was a co-founder of Siri. And it was not, I think, not what you might imagine. It wasn't we had great artificial intelligence technology, so we're gonna push that along and, and make a venture. In fact, we had had decades of artificial intelligence technology with DARPA as the primary funder. We had many programs, but we were missing the concept of a business. People were talking about agent technology. Actually, we went around the world talking about creating an institute for AI where we would do agent technology. Agent meaning the computer would, would do services for you. And the reaction most people had was, we can do that too, we don't, we don't need you. And so SRI was trying to create an institute to do that and we thought, this isn't gonna work. And so at the same time, coincidentally, DARPA was created, had created a program which we led called CALO, Cognitive Assistant That Learns and Organizes. That's what CALO stands for, Cognitive Assistant. The concept was CALO would serve you and whatever you needed even before you knew you needed it. 
So who, raise your hand if you know MASH, the movie, the movie series. Okay, Rader O'Reilly, do you remember him? Rader O'Reilly is what, what our model was. Honest to God, we wanted to, to know and help the colonel before the colonel knew what he wanted to do. Okay, that inspired Siri. But it didn't, there wasn't a single bit of intellectual property, by the way, not one patent. There are seven patents we transferred from SRI uh, into, into the company Siri. Now, one of them was from that particular program. But the inspiration was to create a virtual personal assistant. Okay, so we had the inspiration, but there's a big problem. How do you make money off that? How do you, what, what are you doing with it? And so we then had a second inspiration, which still didn't solve the money problem. The second inspiration was we could have a personal assistant, but how's it going to assist you? Well, we will use Siri to be a do engine for you. It will do things for you, not just give you links. Well, that was beautiful, because if I could get Siri to do things for me, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have Google as a competitor. I don't want to be thought of as a search company and go up against Google. OK, so was that hard? To be a do engine is the limits of artificial intelligence at the time, because it had, a, suppose you said, Make me, uh, get me a hotel reservation in San Francisco tomorrow night near Union Square. That's hard. It isn't hard to take voice and turn it into text. We had previously created a company called Nuance to do that, and I can tell you that story some other day. But what was hard about it was to recognize the intent of the sentence, which was to find, uh, find a hotel reservation, to recognize what the application was that would give it to us, recognize the keywords that would manage that intent and put those keywords into something like, uh, you know, uh, 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 travel advisor or something like that that would give you an answer and then recognize the answer and give it back to the user. It, take, it took the most brilliant AI scientists at SRI to do it. And by the way, that science has been superseded now by much greater AI technology that we should talk about. So how did that turn into a company? We still had one fundamental problem. How do you make money? Well, it was easy. If you ask Siri to make that hotel reservation, it would lead you to travel advisor or to whatever website it was, and we would get a fee, a commission, for lead generation to that company. And without that business model, there wouldn't have been a Siri, just to be clear. It isn't an oh, by the way. You must have, with the breakthrough technology, the breakthrough venture concept. And together is what we can do. And then, finally, we had a company that we felt we could make, with three people, by the way. Three, we had three co-founders who left, and we got investment from Steve, from um, uh, Morgan Thaler and Menlo Ventures, and life went on for 18 months, and we built Siri. And I'm almost, I have a little more time. So we built Siri. We built the product. It was remarkable. And by the way, it was the result of another great moat revolution. Not just an AI revolution, but the mobile phone revolution. The mobile phone was always on, always connected, a supercomputer in your pocket. And for the first time, we could use that for the services of Siri. Then we had to actually measure, why Siri? Why is this valuable? Why not let people go to the links? Well, if you click on links, at the time, people weren't so good with their thumbs as they are right now. But so if they clicked on these things, about 80% of the people would drop out if they were brought to a website on their mobile phone. So we had a quantitative statement that said, 
you will not have people dropping out. People will want to use Siri. Okay. So we launched Siri out of its own company, Siri. Active, the original name was Active Technologies. We launched Siri, and it is being downloaded at one a second, which was very fast at the time. So terrific success. And then two weeks later, ranks ranking up on the applications, great news, great everything, our CEO gets a phone call on his mobile phone, which is a little, little weird, person he didn't know. Hi, this is Steve. And Dog, who's the CEO, said, Steve who? And he said, Steve Jobs. And Dog said, right, and hung up. <laughs> then he gets the call again. Hi, this is Steve. Steve Jobs, for real. And I'd love for you to come over to my house tonight with your friends and visit and we'd have a conversation. So Dog calls the board. I was on the board as well. Dog calls the board and said, what do I do? What do I do? And we said, go, but don't talk about money. Because what do you think our intent was with Siri? Did we want to be sold or did we want to go public and be our own company? How many say sold? How many say go public? I wanted to go public. Our board wanted to go public. But then the reality distortion field began. And you're talking about the CEO of Apple calling. How many times do you think he called over the next two weeks? Great numbers. Shout it out. <laughs> 10. Probably 20 or more times cold. And the, the price kept going up as well. And at some point, not only was the price right, but the team wanted to go. And we learned a new lesson, which was if the founding team wants to go, you better let them go. And you better make the sale, even if you don't want to. They were uniformly saying, we want to work with Steve Jobs. The reality distortion field was there. They're going to put a ding in the universe. God bless. And we had two weeks before it had to be sold, because we, in those two weeks, we also had to deliver an Android version to another customer, Verizon. And we were not going to lose $30 million for that contract if this didn't happen, if that sale didn't occur. So 20 lawyers or so descended upon me. I've never had more lawyers in a room in my life. And we talked about the uh, elements of the acquisition and the, the final price and the intellectual property and who owns it and whether it's not exclusive or exclusive and all those things. And, uh, and Siri was sold. I still teach at Stanford once a year. What would you have done? Would you have sold? Or would you have gone, continued to go public? The trouble was, if you were going to continue to go public, forget the, the founder question. You have two to three years before you're generating necessarily enough revenue to become a great success. So that's uh, my story. And I'd love for you to, any of you to ask questions until Lisa pulls me off the stage. She said, there's a hook over there. Yes. Yes, please. Where are you at in building the Venture Studio? So about um, two or three days, maybe a week ago, we, we finally uh, closed on in the formation of the company, because it, the Venture Studio is a company. And we are now in the process of recruiting team members. And we're in the process of finding a space. Because I really want to find a space that, that represents not only the greatness of your technology and your business savvy here, but a space that is a go-to place where people want to say, oh my god, I'm going to see the future. We did that. I, I was on the team that helped build HDTV. When we did that, everybody wanted to see HDTV, right? We want a place like that where people are going to come in and 
and say, I'm going to see the future here, but it's not just the future, it's a company. Other question? Yes? No, the Venture Studio will be in New Mexico. Oh, okay. I pictured it being the standard. Uh, we are committed to the Venture Studio being here, and not only the Venture Studio, but the companies that are created from the Venture Studio. And I think that's really valuable because this is where the great gold, the gold is. This is the, the gold rush of, of, of the, the, our century, and this is what you have as well as the ability to build them upon that. Other questions? Yes? So your business model is a little bit different, but do you think the pandemic will happen? Change the propensity? Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. I, first of all, VCs from everywhere, I think, will want to invest with us. Uh, we will invest at the pre-seed. First of all, we'll invest at the venture studio stage, then the pre-seed stage, then the seed stage. Now you're getting into frontier fund as opposed to the venture studio. And, and if you're familiar with venture capitalists, which I'm sure you are, they all like to co-invest together. They share the risk that way. And so we are highly open. Not only are we open to it, they will want to. Every VC, I've worked with the best of the best, right? In Sequoia, Kleiner, Kosla, Andreessen. They'd all be excited about working with us here. Other question? Yes? Hold on one second. I am a little hard of hearing. Yeah. You're going to have the, the Roadrunner Studios across the state. Um, and I was wondering what the capacity of how many companies do you think you'll be able to touch in some way or invest in throughout the uh, tenure? Through th 10 years? 10 years, so during your time frame. I, well, we'll probably invest in many. And if we had two or three a year, that uh, one criteria when I say invest. We have no intention of investing in a normal company. We want one that will be a breakthrough, a multi-billion dollar transformational company from great technology into great business. So we'll, we will work on 10 or more a year, probably get two or three that we really think could be those breakthroughs over each year, and it could be a 10-year term. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for your remarks. So excited to have you here. My name's Patricia Knighton with the Arrowhead Center at New Mexico State University. And we're very much engaging in institutional uh, investment and shareholders of companies. Do you guys in your venture studio have uh, existing models or experience with such things? And are you open to doing that? In terms of getting additional investment? And shareholders. So the Venture Studio will be a for-profit entity. It will seek investment. We'll take your check today. <laughs> and um, we will seek investment, and we will give equity in exchange for that investment. Absolutely. Yeah. Lisa, am I OK? Two minutes. OK, yes. Hal? of the two national labs that are here, and the Air Force Research, and all this military frontier technology that might be developed here. I am humbled by the research that's going on in these national labs and these universities and institutes. So that's why we're here. That's why we want to work with you. Now, there's this challenge, right? Well, let's go back to the valley of death. The challenge is, is something at the point where it could be deployed into or a product, or is it ongoing research that just has to continue? Actually, if it has to continue, we also work with the government. We're working closely with the federal government, and maybe they will help. And we will certainly try to get help with them. 
If it's near product, though, then we can really get to create and build a venture. Now, I want to say no technology that I'm aware of, no deep technology, is, works on everything. So if people are constantly trying to improve the technology, forget it. It's not going to be, uh, it's a never-ending path. That's the job of, a, I know, I was a PhD. I know the job of you just keep building on the next great possibility. But if you define a product like we did with Siri, which said, OK, we're only going to do this for giving you, you know, doing things for you. And by the way, we restricted it to travel and entertainment in the beginning. Because we knew that if you asked Siri any question at all, it would fail. It had to be restricted into a domain. And so, by the way, that Apple didn't understand that at the time. And and it, there were a lot of crazy questions to Siri that didn't get good answers, like where do I bury a body or something? Uh, how do I find a girlfriend? So this is not something Siri can answer. <laughs> yes? Uh, hi there. Yeah, is a New Mexican who's been following the news about what you're doing and just couldn't be more excited about this venture. I just nod my head up and down with everything you're saying. Yeah. Completely agree. Um, I've been dying for more news on this venture, and I wonder, can you speak at all to the timeline you guys have in mind for moving forward with opening a studios and some of the other things? We're, we're out there right now. Let me introduce you to Adam Hammer. He's raised his hand here, or stand up, Adam. Adam's here today to help uh, and work to, I work together with him and, and others. I, I am not the CEO of Roadrunner. I'm a general partner in the fund, but I love what we're doing. And Adam is going to help make it happen. We're looking at space. We're looking at, at uh, recruiting people. We're excited. And, uh, and I think we, we have a chance of recognizing and doing what mining the, this great technology that you have here with the partners that you all have here, what you've been doing, and just providing some more resources such in money and people to help make it happen. Other questions? Did I? I, I think we're done then. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Norman, for the, all of the information about these exciting developments for our state. We're going to now move into the first uh, session, which is about technology capabilities in New Mexico. And our first speaker will be Joaquin uh, Lone Jaramillo, who is an aerospace engineer with Spaceport America. Thanks for having me here today. So I got to apologize in advance. Scott McLaughlin, our executive director, was uh, supposed to be here today and make this talk. But unfortunately, he couldn't make it. So you're going to be stuck with me for the day. Um, we're good? OK. <laughs> Do I have a little? Have a button or something? There we go. Something. So this is a pretty broad audience. Not all of you are related to aerospace. So I wanted to take a step back and just what's the definition of a spaceport? So in the US, this means something very specific. It's a, a, a site that's licensed by the FAA to do launch and reentry um, operations. And so this was enabled by the Commercial Space Launch Act in 1984, which really fostered uh, private innovations in the space industry. So New Mexico really has a, a rich history in this, uh, in aerospace and space in general. There's almost too many accomplishments to list, 
Um, I don't know why Scott actually tried listing them because <laughs> it is too many. Um, obviously, we have great uh, institutions like Holloman Air Force Base, Air Force Research Lab, the Sandia, LANL. Um, actually, the first photograph from space was taken from a V-2 rocket that launched out of White Sands Proving Ground uh, back in 1946. So spaceport, a little bit more spaceport history, is it started in the, in the early 90s. Several visionaries saw New Mexico as a great place to launch with their high altitude, low humidity, um, uncongested airspace and ground space. We don't have a whole lot of people once you, once you get out of the big cities. But uh, with, it really culminated with the XPRIZE Cup in 2004. And so uh, Advanced Composites uh, won the XPRIZE Cup, and this kind of started uh, spaceport a little bit more specifically. Um, obviously, we have Virgin Galactic there, and that's what, what was our anchor tenant and let us, let us start our operations at the spaceport. So our, for those of you who don't know, because I, th I think there's a lot of uh, incorrect impressions about the spaceport, we are owned by the state of New Mexico. So we're a state-owned state and operated facility. And so our statutory mission uh, is to foster economic development in the area, provide opportunities and job opportunities, obviously build out the facilities uh, of the spaceport itself, and as well as provide uh, STEM outreach uh, in our local area and work with our local institutions. So we actually have a lot of competition. So there's several, over a dozen licensed spaceports uh, spread across the country. Um, and some of these are more active than others. So for instance, uh, we have some of our, our bigger competitors in the area, such as Midland or Colorado Air and Spaceport, um, are licensed spaceports, but they, their Denver, for instance, is right next to the Colorado Air and Spaceport. And so their location is, is probably going to limit what kind of, of aerospace uh, activities they can actually get accomplished in their area. Uh, they obviously can do uh, things on the ground, uh, so there are more competition in, in terms of in that regard. Uh, but our, our uncongested area is really an asset to us when it comes to uh, flights, so rockets, uh, any sort of suborbital flight. Uh, if you look at the United States at night, you can see New Mexico is, is pretty dark. <laughs> and this is a good thing for us, though it's also a challenge because uh, it's, we're, we're far away from, from uh, other towns. So Las, we're right next to uh, TRC and Las Cruces. Uh, and the biggest asset that we have is that we're actually underneath the White Sands Missile Range airspace complex. And so we're under restricted airspace. Um, and this, again, goes back to one of, one of our key advantages, is not only do we not have a whole lot of people in this basin, uh, but we have restricted airspace. And so if you look at this time lapse of air traffic over our area, you can see there's a really big dark spot where, it, where White Sands Missile Range is. And so we have the benefit of being able to operate uh, within White Sands Missile Range airspace, um, which is a really big advantage to our customers, because if they were to do that, anywhere else, they would have to work uh, really carefully with the FAA. And if they were able to do schedule some sort of temporary flight restriction, it would, it would probably be pretty difficult to do that on a regular basis. And so uh, that's, that's where we come in. So we talk about Spaceport in, in three different areas. Uh, we have our horizontal launch area, which is where our 12,000 foot runway is. Uh, we have several customers, uh, tenants, who are there, VG is obviously the, one of the biggest ones. Um, we also have a couple high altitude uh, UAV platforms, so, uh, such as AeroVironment and Prismatic. Uh, this is where really most of our infrastructure is located. We have the vertical launch area, which as it sounds, this is where we do more vertical launches, uh, especially our, our rocket launches. And so this year actually we're, we're about to get electricity uh, down to, the, to that area. And then at the bottom we have the advanced uh, technology area, and this is where Spin Launch is located. So you probably have seen their their structure uh, in the news at some point. So we've been pretty busy. Do we have a, a video? We're supposed to have a video as well. Okay, actually, if you could just if you could load that video, that'd be this would be a good time. So most recently, we had the, the Thunderbirds here for the last two weeks in, in January doing their winter training. So they returned, actually. They were here the year before. Uh,
Videos are always funner than slides anyway, so thank you for your patience. I'm guessing I'm about out of time. Anyway, can, you can come to my, uh, I have a booth set up, so I'm happy to answer any questions over there. Uh, and thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you very much, Joaquin. What an interesting presentation, thank you. Our next speaker is Walt Ugalde, who is an economic development executive with NASA and one of our partners in planning this event. So welcome, Walt. Mic check. All right, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, particularly in person. I know the past couple of years have been challenging, so uh, what I'd like to do is recognize Lisa's team for organizing this event. Uh, if everybody wouldn't mind giving them a round of applause, please. All right. And so uh, I start off this slide uh, with this vision that we've had for quite a long time in NASA as early as the 60s and 70s of, of humans on Mars, right? And so for most of the entrepreneurs and organizations in the room, it's important to have that vision. And so we've always had that vision. And what I'm going to show you is how technology drives the exploration. So when you have that vision, you can set the strategy. Uh, my name is Walter uh, Ugaldi. I go by Walt. I am a Gallegos. I am from, uh, my family's from Albuquerque. 
uh, so we have long-lasting roots here. Um, what I'm going to do on this on this uh, trip here is I'm going to kind of give a broad overview, a reintroduction to NASA, if you will, the programs and and kind of what we're doing, why we're doing it. All right, uh, and then in the end we'll show you how we we go to astropreneurship. All right, so who we are and what we do, right? So NASA's mission, particularly the human exploration side of the equation, is to enable human exploration through technology development, technology transfer, and through public-private uh, partnerships. And particularly this third iteration of human exploration, the public-private venture is, is more imperative than ever. All right, so NASA, as some of you may know, uh, we are headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, JSC Houston uh, is obviously located in Houston where Mission Control is. Uh, and then White Sands Test Facility is located in, in Las Cruces. So we have 10 field centers uh, with seven satellite facilities. All right, and then NASA is uh, subdivided into basically four or five business lines, right? Uh, the first one, the human exploration and space operations, which recently have just got split into uh, op side and, and exploration. We have our science mission directorate with many of the institutions here are engaged in the R&D uh, with, with that side of the equation. We also have our aeronautics research division, uh, and then finally our space technology and mission directorate, which kind of matrixes uh, programs across all of those, those business lines. All right, and so at the Johnson Space Center, we're known as the hub of human exploration. Uh, and that involves Mission Control Houston and obviously our partners down at White Sands and Las Cruces. Uh, and we get asked all the time, hey, now that the shuttle's gone, what are you guys working on, right? Uh, so we had two primary programs for the most part on the human exploration side, shuttle and station. Uh, and so now we're managing no more or no less than six programs. And you can see across the top as we expand our reach into uh, pushing humans further into the galaxy, uh, we still have the space station. We are now in the process of uh, commercializing low Earth orbit. We have the private astronaut missions uh, that many of you have seen, uh, the Orion module and the associated SLS launch system, uh, commercial lunar payloads. I think you saw intuitive machines on the, the last slide, which is, is one of our uh, partners as well. Uh, then also the international uh, gateway, the lunar gateway, uh, which will be a, a space station orbiting the moon that will get our astronauts up and down. Uh, and then all of that kind of threads together in this other overarching strategy of, of getting humans uh, beyond low Earth orbit uh, to the moon permanently uh, and then on to Mars. And so then at White Sands, we'll, we'll go here first. Uh, White Sands was started back in 1962-ish, right? So it was part of the Apollo uh, program. Uh, and they're a component facility of the Johnson Space Center. They have 28 square miles down in Las Cruces. Uh, about a budget of 70 million and about 575 employees. Uh, the core capabilities at White Sands, obviously it's related to propellant and propulsion systems. Uh, I won't read through everything here. Uh, one of the things that I do want to mention for the folks in the room um, is, is that uh, we are known for the flight acceptance standards testing uh, whatnot. So if there's commercial companies that are looking to get certified, we have the capability and the know how to do that for you or, or to help you to move into that equation. Um, and then also there's some secondary translational um, services for industry and startups. An example is precision cleaning of sensitive instruments, uh, calibration labs, uh, measurement standards, and then also industrial and scientific imaging and, and documentation. So uh, most of the folks don't think of us as, as a good place to partner uh, when it comes to small businesses and startups, uh, but we do have that capacity to do so and we're willing to do so. Uh, and then also, uh, and I think this is important, particularly as the industry cluster here in New Mexico continues to grow, uh, you'll start to see that uh, a lot of the companies begin to play with a lot of volatiles, right? Uh, and we have experts uh, and expertise in those volatile systems, uh, and we can train uh, your organization uh, to learn how to handle those uh, uh, elements. All right. And then... Finally, for White Sands, uh, one of the things that we try to do is be good community partners. So we recognize that we're part of the uh, Mesilla Valley Economic Development Region, uh, the industry cluster. Uh, we make sure that our folks are out in the community, whether it's STEM engagement, uh, partnering, or just volunteering in the community to make uh, Las Cruces a great place to, to live and work. Uh, and we're looking forward to continuing that relationship. All right. so. So NASA has been enabling human exploration and technology development for the past 60 years, right? And so at the beginning of it, I'm going to give you a little bit of trivia, right? Apollo 17, anybody know who was the astronaut from New Mexico uh, that was walked on the moon? 
Harrison Schmidt, that's exactly right. Now, the significant fact about that was he was the first scientist to walk on the moon. Everybody else was a military commander or a fighter pilot or something like that. He was the first scientist, right? And so you'll begin to see the roots of science exploration and science expertise begin to permeate our technology development program. All right? And then here's a factoid for you. All right? So back in 1991, we had two astronauts from the state of New Mexico fly on the same mission on STS-40. Y'all know who that was? All right, so Sidney Gutierrez, and it was Drew Gaffney, right? So New Mexico is, has a deep-rooted history, so where we go from the beginning of the Apollo program, then you've got these two astronauts that are right in the middle of the space station of build. These folks uh, ended up putting the science laboratory up on the International Space Station space station to where we're at today and today we have our leadership team from white sands jason noble he's a las cruces native his associate miguel is from santa fe my uh, deputy director lauren parsons she is from albuquerque and then my family's from albuquerque so you can see this long-running tradition right and it's and we continue to do so and, and stay engaged so when we talked about economic development uh one of the things that we started doing when we pivoted from from the space shuttle uh, was to begin to start thinking of space in, in space sectors or market economies, right? And we have three market economies, uh, Earth and low Earth orbit, lunar, and then Mars. And what we are doing is, is beginning to develop the technologies for humans to stay permanently on the moon and in LEO uh, and, and also on the Mars. And there are four foundational programs, if you will, that are help, helping us drive that technology. Uh, one of them is the, the gateway and the commercialization aspect of it and the international partnering. Uh, the other one is commercial lunar payload services, the human landing system, and then, of course, the uh, low Earth orbit uh, commercialization. So I don't know if you know, but right now there is uh, in works three commercial uh, space stations uh, that are U.S. Um, that are, are being proposed to, to begin to replace the International Space Station. Then we'll have a fourth one uh, on the moon. All right, so some of those technologies that we're developing, and in this case, this comes from our Lunar Surface uh, Innovation Initiative. Um, as you can see, and I believe our keynote speakers started talking about those translational um, technologies, right, those game changers, and we talked about clean tech, he talked about power systems, he talked about all that. All of that technology are things that we are working on for permanent presence on the moon. And through the program that I'll show you, we intend to push that out to the market, to the organizations and institutions out here in New Mexico, so perhaps they can leverage that venture fund. All right, so in all this, I kind of answered a little bit of the question is, is what can NASA tech do for me here on Earth, right? And I get asked that all the time. Well, what we do is when we take that technology, we capture it, and we put it into these portfolios that are uh, basically uh, categorized the, the IP and, and different things into uh, three categories. Uh, most of what we do on the technology transfer side is early stage uh, components. Uh, most of you are aware of the SBIR uh, program. Uh, and so we package all that and then we go out and we, we publish this and we put it out on the street. We work with uh, startup innovation hubs such as New Mexico Startup Factory, right? We go into the schools with the Tech Transfer University program. Uh, we pretty much kind of go anywhere and everywhere you folks ask us to do and try to find a program to put you into to our technology, right? Uh, and so one of those programs is called Startup NASA. And this program is designed for entrepreneurs. We call it uh, three for free, so anybody can come in, license some of our IP. Uh, if you're a startup, um, you get the license for free for three years. We want you to take your money and funnel that money into your product development, your prototyping services, whatever it is you need. And at the fourth year is when we start uh, pooling revenue. As a federal entity, we try not to profit from that, so we don't pool a whole lot of revenue whatsoever. Uh, it usually runs between 3.5 to 4.2% on the uh, minimum royalties uh, with about a $3,000 um, minimum royalty fee. So it's a great program. Uh, we have our patent portfolio and our software catalog, and those can be viewed uh, if you use your Siri at technology.nasa.gov, right? And, and it should pop right up, all right? So our portfolio, uh, our patent uh, website, is categorized into 15 portfolios. There is a search engine on there where you can just 
type, whatever subject matter you're looking for, non-destructive evaluation, whatever. The cool thing about it is it will pop up technologies from all 10 field centers. So if any of you have questions or are ever looking into this, you can connect to White Sands, and through White Sands, you have access to the whole breadth of NASA, right? So that's the beauty of partnering with our folks down in Las Cruces, uh, is that access point, that concierge component. Um, and if they don't know, they'll call someone who knows, right? All right, and so here's an example. We always talk about in the, in the uh, technology transfer world, in the partnerships world, uh, technologies for spin out and spin in. And this is an example of a technology. We designed it for us, we spun it out to industry, and then it found its way back into one of our mission programs through a commercial uh, LEO. So the Bigelow uh, expandable activity module uh, is basically an inflatable that you can compress, uh, creates a low mass for launch, so it's easy plug it up there, blow it up, you can put all your toys or all your stuff in there. So now you got these free floating laboratories, right? And when you, we go to commercial low earth uh, orbit, you're gonna begin to see, so instead of the Bigelow logo, you're gonna see a UNM logo, right? So it's gonna be the UNM microgravity uh, research laboratory, right? And you'll have these joint ventures with these research institutes. Now that's just something that I just threw out there, but it's very doable. <laughs> so if anybody's interested, give us a holler. Um, all right, and then another one that we spun out to industry, this is a, a component of partnering, um, collaborative research, and then spinning technology out through our tech transfer program. Uh, this was a joint venture with GM through our Robonaut, uh, in particular with uh, an element we call the RoboGlove. And so the uh, company called BioServer approached us uh, and approached GM, and one of the things that we're trying to do was reduce the injuries to, uh, to hands, to ligaments, soft tissues from repetitive motions in uh, the manufacturing plant. So uh, we licensed that technology to them. Uh, they came up with this lightweight portable vest with a battery pack and a, a robotic assist glove. So it, it had a feedback system, so when it would grab like a plate of glass, it just blink, and then you really weren't using a whole lot of hand strength to handle that. All right, and so now um, I showed you two examples, one spin in, spin out. Uh, what I'd like to show here on this chart is kind of how we work with entities to help them work through this pipeline, right? So we have a, a thing here, you see T2X, and it's our technology expansion program. So it's basically tech transfer on steroids. And the first example is a company that came in through the NFL Players Association. Uh, it was right during pre-COVID, COVID, COVID timeframe, they grabbed the technology from our space station uh, filtration system and they started applying it to air conditioning systems in buildings and part of it was to uh, clean the air out like we, we do on the space station. The second one is a smart tire company. Anybody here watch Shark Tank? Right, so this company ended up on Shark Tank and doing a pitch. Uh, and so they came in through through our program, we mapped them in with FedTech and, and all three of these, uh, FedTech, uh, some of you are familiar with them. Uh, and they ended up on Shark Tank, and so that brought a lot of cool visibility to our program. Uh, I believe they're still cranking away on that. And then finally, the third one, Canopy Aerospace. Uh, this is a great example of what I always try to tell my audiences or my partners is find a way to bundle this kind of stuff, right? So this is a group that came in, they had a Collaborative Space Act Agreement, which is basically a fancy way of saying an MOU for the DOD folks in the room. Uh, and so they started doing collaborative research. They ended up licensing the technology uh, to build a product, and then they also folded that into an SBIR. So here's a company that leveraged three of our programs, right, that enable uh, commercialization and fosters economic development, and they fully took advantage of that. So uh, I truly feel that's kind of like next level stuff. Uh, and for those of the, the folks that are engaged with the other federal laboratories here, uh, this is a great way to do that, right? Uh, a lot of folks don't need know to do that. Oftentimes when you approach some of the, the smaller venture capitalist stuff, when they see that you have this, uh, it brings somewhat of ec equity. They know that you have a smart team, uh, you're coachable, and they're, they're willing to invest in you. All right, and then finally, uh, the technologies that we brought to the table here in your folders, uh, you folks will see that we brought 23 patents and we brought the patents that kind of played in the life science space, uh, a little bit of, of augmenting the human, uh, if you will, uh, and they fall into categories of biotech, medical and monitoring, uh, robotic technologies for healthcare, uh, RFID technologies for dispensaries, medical hardware people, basically the logistics side of, of the medical industry, if you will, all right. Uh, and so when the question is, is, you know, what does NASA technology do for me? Uh, well, NASA technology launches startups, 
That's what we're in the businesses in, in, in the technology transfer program. And so with that, I want to thank you. It's been an honor being here speaking with you. Uh, by all means, go to spinoff.nasa.gov or technology.nasa.gov to learn more. Uh, if you've got questions about your tech and your folders, by all means, come see me at the table. Uh, come grab some spinoff magazines. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Walt. And while we're not taking questions after each presenter, the networking break is time where you can talk to our speakers and, and interact, ask them questions. So our final speaker for this session is Darlene Harbour, who's president of Loveless Scientific Resources. And she's my colleague as a, a board member on NMBio as well. So welcome, Darlene. So thank you for having me here, and it's so nice to see so many people together in our great state of New Mexico. Um, when Lisa first asked me to talk at uh, Innovate New Mexico, I wasn't quite sure how to put it all together, but as, we, um, as I go through what I'm about to tell you, you'll be able to understand why what I do is so important in the uh, technology space. So I work for a company, Lovelace Scientific Resources. And so um, who's Lovelace Scientific Resources? What do they do? Well, first of all, let me just mention that Lovelace Scientific Resources is not affiliated with the healthcare delivery system anymore. We used to be a long time ago. But Lovelace Scientific Resources is basically a clinical research company. And um, most of the work that we do is is somehow related to um, technology in a former fashion and then move to the clinical research space. So Loveless Scientific Resources, LSR, was founded in 1987. We're headquartered here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We are a subsidiary of the, what is now the Loveless Biomedical Research Institute. And they are a basic science, lab science, um, contract research organization primarily working in the drug development space. However, they used to have um, be mostly affiliated with the federal government um, in doing environmental research. So what does LSR do? So in the industry, we're actually known as a clinical research site. And what that means is, yes, we do help pharmaceutical companies bring new drugs to the market. But what we also, there is so much more to it than that. We provide management services. We help with research in AI. Um, years ago, when we were first starting out, our parent company couldn't find a way to get um, their basic science into the clinical arena. So because of all of the local entities and how hard to get it was to get it spread out before Zoom, and so what they did is they incorporated this entity so they could take their basic science and move it into the clinical arena. So um, other things that Level of Scientific Resources does is we provide management services. So there are many investigators, doctors, nurses, radiologists that all want to do research, but they don't know how to do it. They don't know where to start. They don't know how to begin. So we help them with that infrastructure, providing services, employees, regulatory services, clinical services. This is how you get in to talk with the FDA. This is how it all happens. And we do that not only in the state of New Mexico, but we've done it across the um, country, California, Nevada, Arizona, Washington, Texas, and Florida have been the spaces that we've mostly worked in. So what is clinical research and what does that have to do with technology? Well, it's a scientific approach to try and figure out mostly the safety and effectiveness of medications, devices, processes and procedures. It's not just drugs going to market. 
And who, who do we conduct clinical research with? Well, of course, health organizations. And, um, you know, and that includes hospitals, outpatient clinics, group practices. But we also do work with the military. And much of what we've done with the military has been able, um, we've been provided that infrastructure in some of their installations to help them conduct the research they want to work, uh, they want to do. So we've worked with the Navy Medical Center in San Diego. Um, we've worked with Joint Base, Joint Base Lewis McCord in Tacoma. We've had virtual networks working on um, traumatic brain injuries. And also we've worked with the um, FDA in some of their spaces um, in getting new uh, treatments through that the military has actually uh, done the research on. So a lot of the um, processes, procedures, and even medications that we enjoy today in the healthcare space have come from the military and the research that they've done on the clinical side. Uh, an example of that would be traumatic brain injury. How do we get those troops from the theater to a medical facility without making their traumatic brain injury worse? And so that is some of the work that we do with the military. What kind of treatment do we do um, to take care of those um, troops that are in the field? How do we get them treated better? And so um, when you think about clinical research, yes, we do help bring drugs to the market through with pharmaceutical companies, but it is so much more than that. Um, with the FDA, a lot of the work that we've done with them has had to be, uh, is affiliated in the tobacco space. And so a lot of the vaping products, why, you know, how does, how does this vaping device work? What does it do? How does it affect uh, people? What is the juice inside it that, you know, that we're, um, that we should be looking at to make sure that our public is being kept, spa uh, kept safe? Another example would be cigarettes and cigarillos. Um, no one knows what the content of nicotine is in any one of those products. It's not regulated. It's not standardized. And even smokeless tobacco, chewing tobacco. Why do people want to use menthol, and what does the menthol do when you add it to the chewing tobacco that makes it um, much more potent? So all, there's so much to do in clinical research that you don't hear about, but it is all happening here in New Mexico. We work with educational institutions, a lot in social behavior, um, which is so important to our school systems. And then we also work with our um, state, local and state governments. When the health insurance exchanges first came out, we um, had no idea why people weren't signing up. And so the state uh, partnered with us to try and figure that out. And we went all through the state of New Mexico and learned that, well, guess what? They, um, our state isn't signing up for the health insurance exchanges because they don't qualify. They're in a totally different lower socioeconomic class, so it was good information for the state to know to help um, fund the, get those people the insurance that they needed. Um, obviously, in healthcare, we you're going to work with all the healthcare um, uh, disciplines. You know, dentists, physical therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, teachers, nurses. Um, but that's just a little bit of what um, clinical research can bring to the state of New Mexico. There are many more people that work on it than that. So why is clinical research so important? So when we do research with the FDA, their job primarily is to help bring public policy to um, everything, to regulate what, what is in the juices in e-cigarettes, how much nicotine can be put into a cigar, and how to market it, and also to learn all of the health benefits, if any, and all of the health risks associated with using products like that. Um, another uh, reason that we do a lot of drug research is because not, not only do we need new innovation, but we also need to find out why some patients don't tolerate certain medications. 
Why do certain medications work in some populations and not other populations? And this is what we call targeted research. And it's um, looking at genomics and trying to figure out, you know, what is it about this specific gene sequence that allows a, this patient to be able to have such good success with a specific type of treatment. Of course, we're always looking for safer treatment options and devices. We're using a lot of AI research right now um, to help diagnose and treat patients earlier. How can we find those diseases that are not picked up at an early stage, <clears throat> excuse me, that could have been, you know, changed someone's outcome? So, um, you know, we're, uh, so that's where a lot of the technology comes in. Surgical instruments, procedures, what is the, I mean, and it can be as simple as, what, how do you take a blood pressure? How many of you go to the doctor's office, they slap a blood pressure cuff on you and, you know, immediately you get a reading? Um, you know, all of that has come from research in the best ways to take it. We also want to know what is the most effective way to do surgery? What is the most effective way to treat patients? And what kinds of processes do we need to have in place? And some of this research doesn't, is not always have a good outcome. But what's good about it is we know and we learn that okay, that didn't work. We need to figure out a different way to bring this, um, this innovation to the public and the healthcare field. We need to have a better understanding of how medicines and um, devices work. And so part of what we do is um, the research on devices. A lot of that has come from our military research, you know, um, prosthetics. You know, now you see people running with prosthetics. Who would have ever thought that would have happened years ago? And so we, none of us can um, benefit from that if we didn't go through the steps of healthcare research. So um, who regulates research anyway? Well, of course, the Food and Drug Administration does here in the United States. Um, but we also have so many other entities within the federal government that make sure that our research is highly regulated. And so the department, we have the Department of Health and Human Services that actually works on um, setting regulations and making sure that it can be applied to um, all the research across all entities. And we have the Office of Human and Research Protection. That OHRP basically ensures that the patients that volunteer to be in research are actually taken care of and they're uh, treated fairly and safely. We have internal review boards that do a more local oversight of the research that's being conducted here on a local level um, to make sure, again, that the protocol is safe, it's justifiable, and again, that the patient's rights and welfare will be taken into account. Internationally, there's an organization called the International Council of Harmonization, and basically what that does, um, if you subscribe and are a member of the council, the research that you do would be followed by all countries and conducted the same way. Years ago, if you had a drug approved in um, the United States, you would have to do another research project in another country to have it meet those country standards. But now, with the International Council, we can actually conduct studies the same across all countries. So if a new, mar a new drug, a new device, a new process gets approved, it can be applied with some nuances, of course, to the two other countries. So um, it's, it's not just what happens here on a local level, it's what happens, you know, in the world. And very, um, New Mexico is very much a part of that. And of course, how that uh, relates to technology is, you know, how does that drug get manufactured? How does that device get developed? Um, what do we need to know about it on the lab science side before it goes to a human? So, and much of that happens right here in our state and you just don't realize it um, because we're not good at, at 
telling the public of what we do. So um, some of the um, people that fund research, obviously, are the federal government, and most of uh, you have heard that, of course, the National Cancer Institute, the National Eye Institute, they're some of the bigger funders of the local research that we do here in New Mexico. Of course, you have pharmaceutical companies that fund research. Um, but now you're seeing more uh, funding come from biotech companies. Even local hospitals will fund their own research and educational institutions. We have startups that are funding work in AI right here in the state of New Mexico. And um, it's really exciting to see that now. So um, thank you for talking about that earlier, Norman. Um, so some of the major players that uh, are involved in research uh, here in the state of New Mexico, obviously University of New Mexico, the hospital, the health science center, outpatient clinics, surgery centers, emergency room departments, um, level scientific resources. We're mostly outpatient. We not only do research, but we manage a lot of research for other entities. Um, the Vision Research Center at I Associates of New Mexico is doing tremendous work in the field of gene therapy and macular degeneration and, um, <clears throat> and glaucoma, that type of uh, specific research to eye disease. Um, Veterans Administration does a tremendous amount of um, research as well, and their subsidiary, the Biomedical Research Institute of New Mexico, is the entity under the VA that can accept private funds from pharmaceutical companies or private investors to do research for um, our veterans and our active duty. And of course, our local hospitals also do um, a lot of um, clinical research as well. So that's really all I have, and I hope you continue to support research here in New Mexico, and, um, and thank you. Thank you, Darlene. Um, so it was a great session on some of the capabilities here in New Mexico, and I think we kind of just scratched the surface because, as Darlene pointed out in her slide, there are so many organizations conducting research and have these capabilities. Now we've got a networking break, so please uh, take some time to visit the sunroom, and we will reconvene at 10.30. Thank you.